When the Who came out, it was 30 times more shit being thrown at me. I mean, bottles, bottle rockets, shoes, bras, tomatoes, and the Who were like, just another day in rock and roll. Lita Ford is an English-born guitarist, vocalist, and songwriter, and at the age of 16, in the mid-1970s, she became the lead guitarist for the all-female rock band The Runaways, with lead singer Sherry Curry, guitarist Joan Jett, drummer Sandy West, who actually started the band with Joan Jett, and future bangle Mickey Steele. And one year later, the band scored a record deal and released their debut album, The Runaways. Now, when they recorded their first record, no one in the band was over 19 years old. And because The Runaways were the first major all-girl hard rock band, people doubted that they had the power and the attitude to compete with rock and roll legends like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. But The Runaways proved that these five California young girls had their own kind of rock and roll swagger and sound. At a time when rock and roll was in a rapid transition, the Runaways bridged pop, rock, punk, and glam styles of music together, and they wrote many hits. And people loved them. Lita became an integral element of the Runaways' sound until their eventual breakup in April 1979. Now, in 1982, Lita signed with Mercury Records and set about launching a successful glam metal solo career. And she was the first woman in metal. And she is a badass. Eventually, Lita signed with RCA Records, hired Sharon Osbourne Management, and reemerged with a more radio-friendly pop metal sound. Lita's second album, 1984's Dancing on the Edge, did better commercially than her debut album, Out of the Blood, one year before. Dancing on the Edge featured badass drummer, Randy Casilio, who later played with Ozzy Osbourne, and Hugh McDonald on bass, who is now known as Bon Jovi's studio and session bassist. In 1988, Lita's third solo record is her masterpiece titled Lita. Love that title. Lita. And it went platinum, and she had two massive singles. Close My Eyes Forever, a ballad duet she sang and co-wrote with Ozzy Osbourne, and Kiss Me Deadly. Great title. There were deeper cuts like Out of Love, which is a power ballad penned with Nikki Six from Motley Crue, and Can't Catch Me, a song co-written with Motorhead's Lemmy. So Lita's hard work, self-discipline, and perseverance paid off, and I totally relate to that big time. In 2010, Lita contributed her voice to the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 video game Brutal Legend, and she appears as a character named Rima, along with fellow entertainers Jack Black, Tim Curry, Ozzy Osbourne, Lemmy, and Rob Halford. What a group of people. Jeez. In 2016, Lita Ford released Time Capsule, a collection of songs she discovered on old analog tapes from the 1980s, featuring recordings she made with Billy Sheehan, Gene Simmons, Bruce Kulick, Robin Zander, and Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. Dave Navarro, Roger Carter, and Jeff Scott Soto. Guitar player recognized her musical talent when they bestowed her with a certified legend award. I love that. In 2016, she also published her autobiography, Living Like a Runaway. I could go on and on and on and on and on because Lita has done so much. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Right now, she is currently on a nationwide tour is looking forward to releasing a new album in early 2024. Lita, thank you so much for being on my podcast. Now, you just finished two weeks on the road. I mean, how was that? And when was the last time you were on tour? Oh, do you know, the question is, when was the last time we were not on tour? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, I, I love touring and, uh, and my band loves touring, and and so it's it's been really uh, an amazing summer so far. Really, really kick ass. And so I'm home for right now, just in enough time for me to to talk to you, Kenny. And then tomorrow morning we're back out again. 
Wow, you squeezed me in. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Is this tour different than any other other tours, or is it just you just the same format, same type of uh, playlist? Uh, is this different? Not really. It's it's the summer, you know, and the summer everyone comes out. Everybody's out with their families and their their loved ones, and it's just complete, you know, sold out pandemonium. It's just uh, the summers are always a, a really awesome time to tour. Yeah, I know. I know how that is. Now, when yeah, yeah, when you were growing up, I mean, did you, were your parents like supportive of your passion? You know, to be a rock star, play guitar, sing, write songs. Yeah, my parents were my biggest fans. They were really fantastic. My mother, you know, she was from Rome and she had this very thick Italian accent and she would say, Oh, Lita, play the Black Sabbath. Play the Black Magic Woman. You know, you remember Black Magic Woman? It had such a great guitar riff. And they were always encouraging. My father would always show up at a concert, the Runaways or, you know, whatever we were doing at the time. And he would bring his six pack of cores <laughs> and he would show up and just rock out. And, you know, they never questioned anything that I wanted to do. They were always really supportive. I don't know how they put up with half the things I did, really. There is a funny story I I, I read. This is great. This sounds like your mom. She... She saw you outside, you know the story, probably you wearing, you know, your your cut up jeans and she's yelling at you and you, she didn't like you wearing these torn jeans. And she says, Rita, you have to come in. The neighbors are going to see you. <laughs> and you said something like, it's too late, mom. I'm wearing those jeans on my video on. It's all over MTV. Is, is that a yeah. <laughs> is, is that a, a true that story? Just the greatest story. True story. I mean. Those jeans, I think, changed the face of the world <laughs> because everybody started wearing those torn up jeans. And, uh, you know, I, I bought them off of a construction worker on the way home from Lemmy's house. And uh, my girlfriend was driving Patty. She, I was too, too out of it after hanging with Lemmy. I couldn't drive. So I asked her to come pick me up and she was driving me home. And I saw this this uh, young man climbing up and down the power poles. And I said, I, I noticed his jeans. They were shredded all down the front, naturally shredded. You know, it wasn't something that the department stores had put together. And so I asked her to pull over. And she says, why are you going to throw up? I said, no, I, I want to buy this guy's jeans. And, you know, she thought I was out of my mind. But I got out of the car and I said, dude, I love your jeans. I'll give you a hundred bucks for your jeans. So he's like, oh, yeah, and that would be awesome. Oh, a hundred bucks. He walked over to his car and he pulls his jeans off and put on a little pair of shorts and threw me the jeans. I gave him a hundred bucks. And he says, I have another pair in the back of my truck over in the back of my car. And so I said, sold, I'll take them. So I bought two pairs of the shredded jeans and um, a couple of days later, I took them to a woman who did some trickery for me with my clothes. You know, she would put leather and beads and just stuff hanging from the sides and just kind of rocked them out a little bit. And I ended up wearing them on the Kiss Me Deadly video, which my mother hated. You know, Lita, get in the house. You're not letting anyone see you in those jeans. I love it. I, lo I love the accent also. That's so. That's a great story. It's a great story. You know, my mother, anything that was faded, torn, had strings hanging, you know, like threads or anything that was not 100% squeaky clean and shiny and perfectly new, she would throw it away. I mean, I would bring stuff home and it would go missing, oh, no. you know, because it had some some sayings or something on it. She would just throw it away. But uh, the jeans, no, I think they, they made a fashion statement in the rock world. And, and uh, of course, the Ramones, you know, with their torn up jeans, too. I actually have torn up jeans on right now. I'm not going to show them, but they're torn up. They sure are. They're, <laughs> they're black. They're black, but they're torn up. They're skin tight. 
black jeans torn up. I know. I love those too. Hey, when did you realize, I mean, what was that moment? How young were you? You went, I want to do this. I want to be a, you know, a guitar player in a rock and roll band. I had my moment when I saw the Beatles on TV. What was your moment that, you know, you went, I got to do this. Oh, my, my moment. I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday because uh, my cousin had taken me to my first rock concert. How old were you? I was 13. My first rock concert is a little late. You know, a lot of people are going very, very young now. But uh, it was Black Sabbath at the Long Beach Arena. And I walked in and I just went, whoa. And the place was packed, you know, and everybody, this was when everyone could smoke in the venue. So there was all kinds of things being smoked <laughs> in this venue. It was full of smoke. And and the band was so huge on stage. The sound was just life-changing, you know, and their gold crosses were, were glowing in the lights and all this big black hair. And I thought, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to make people feel. You know, it wasn't so much um, to have black hair on a cross, but it, it was how they were making the people feel in the audience. And that was what I wanted to do. I want to make people feel like this. And so, you know, it's crazy because later I became engaged to Tony Iommi. And uh, and I have had a top ten hit single with Ozzy. Isn't that incredible? Those those are great stories. When you know you'd have no idea when you're a kid that that person's going to be in your life. A little bit of a premonition sometimes. You know, you have this feeling from the universe, <laughs> and and sometimes it's right. I recorded an album. We we actually with Tony Iommi and Glenn Hughes. We had created a band. And I went to England and recorded. Uh, it was incredible. But uh, then they put Black Sabbath back together. I mean, do the math. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we were a power trio, and it, it's not, you know, Black Sabbath, but it was badass. And, you know, it's, I hear, you know, I mean, Tony's the king of coming up with lyrical, melodic lines, and you do that too. That's what I love about your soloing, is their melodies, their lines, their, your shredder. But you have melodies, you have lines, you could sing your solos. I love that. That's incredible. I don't know if that, that he influenced you, but it's incredible. Well, you know, growing up in the era that I grew up in, there were a lot of things that we didn't have um, for our sound. We we didn't have a gain. We didn't have a gain channel on the marshals or amplifiers, whatever you use, and. Uh, and we didn't have, um, you know, the guitars were, they were heavy and, um, and you had to actually play them. And, and I mean, not that everyone isn't playing them now, but it was a different style altogether. It was a different feel. And, um, and you really couldn't be a shredder because I think a shredder is a completely different style of guitar playing as opposed to the riff rock kind of thing, you know, like, like Black Sabbath or like, like what I do. And when it comes to a solo, a guitar solo, you know, you have to have a beginning, a middle and an end to your solo rather than just rattling off a bunch of meaningless notes. I wanted to, um, really make each note count. And, um, and, you know, vibrato and, and bending and feel and everything that comes along with those solos, you can sing them. They are very melodic. And, and I'm not very good at just rattling off a bunch of licks, a bunch of riffs. It's not my style. I like it because it's very memorable. It's, it's, yeah, and you have to work at it because every note counts. I love that. Every single note counts when you're playing. You know, I was listening to a whole bunch of songs, you know, the last week, and I'm going, like, wow. Really, really, this is that's in some ways more difficult because you're you're creating melodies like like hook lines as you're soloing. So you began your career at a very young age, and so oh my god, a girl band and you know in rock and roll at a very young age. I mean, you must have had some serious 
life lessons that you learned personally and also, you know, musically that has made you who you are today. I mean, you guys started young. That must have influenced your whole career in many ways, right? Oh, yeah. It was, it, it was just uh, life-changing. I mean, the first tour we did in The Runaways was three months on the road with the Ramones. We supported them. And, uh, you know, this is 1976. And so um, there were a lot, of, a lot of guys in the audience. There were really no women in the audience at that point. And everybody was uh, packed into these venues. I mean, the condensation would be dripping off the ceilings in some of these venues, which I love. I love a good sweat. <laughs> but uh, uh, we went on our first leg of the Ramones tour. And, um, and, and and this was the time when everybody spit on you. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you remember. I do. The spitting phase. It was disgusting. But everybody spit, and so you could look across the across the audience, and you'd see just a bunch of spit flying in the air. And um, and if if you didn't get hit with spit, that means they didn't like you. So you wanted to get hit with spit. And um, I came home after that tour. My father was waiting for me at the gate at LAX Airport. And I got off the plane and I saw his face. <laughs> and I, I put my arms around him and I cried. And uh, he laughed. He laughed at me. <laughs> and I said, you know, Dad, that was, you know, was life-changing stuff. And he laughed at me. And, he, and I never cried again, of course. That was it. But it, it was just so wonderful to see him. How old were you right then? There? 17. Wow, seventeen now with the Ramones. You know, I remember uh, my first my first spitting experience. I was with Mel and Camp. We went to England in nineteen eighty, I think, and uh, they were trying to break him over there in England. It never really quite worked. But all of a sudden, we're we're playing in this place. I'm in the I'm the drummer, so I'm in the back, and there was a couple of guys up front leaning on the front, and they're just looking at at the band. All those guys up front. And they started spitting on John and the guitar. Can you, John went completely apeshit. He goes and gets our big bouncer and he's screaming. So the, but the bass player in our band had the balls to go back and spit in this guy's face. And then the entire <laughs> audience, it was like, Oh no. All over the band, all over the stage. It was a, they were, they were waiting for us to spit at them so they could go completely nuts. It was a, it wasn't a shit show. It was a spit show. A spit show is just unbelievable. I know the, the stuff that happens in the music industry is insane. I remember the Ramones used to have chicken wire up in front of the stage because people would throw things at them all the time. Handfuls of change. Can you imagine being hit with handfuls of change? Back to Melkin, in 1982, his manager said, you have an opportunity to open up for The Who for three shows. Anyway, uh, and John got hit by a bottle. They were throwing stuff. This is stadiums. John gets hit by a bottle, gets knocked out. This is back when they didn't fly PAs. He jumped up on a PA. And I saw the bottle come out. I'm going, no! <laughs> Hits him in the head. But my point is, when The Who came out, it was 30 times more shit being thrown at I mean, bottles, bottle rockets, shoes, bras, tomatoes. And the Who were like, just another day in rock and roll. And they were dodging. And Twistle was knocking with his bass, the, the bottle rockets. It was like, I had never experienced that. That was like, they should have had chicken wire up. Because that was like, it was like, just flying off the audience. Insane. It's crazy. And sometimes you get those big old spotlights in your face and oh. you can't see the audience. <laughs> and that makes me mad. I always ask them to turn them off or turn them down or, or put a filter on them or something. Take a, take a coffee break. I know. It's like, especially in the smaller clubs, it's directly right at you. can't see. Got to be able to see. Yeah. Yeah. In case yeah. you got to dodge a bullet. I know it. 
you're up front. See, I'm a, I'm back there. I I can see it all happening. So when you guys were was the runaways because I know you didn't you know stay together very long, but was it a team like a band like a team of people? Because uh, I know you guys broke up because of creative differences. But when you were together, were you getting along? Were you unified? That kind of band? No. <laughs> I think it's. I mean, not every band is. Some of the greatest bands. Look at, look at the Everly Brothers, or look at the Kinks. They don't even. The brothers don't even talk to each other. I don't know. I mean, it it was messed up, and uh, you know, we were just teenage girls, and everyone was going through their own kind of drama. But I just wanted to play my guitar. I just wanted to play music, and I, that's you know, that was my main priority play your guitar and be good at it and make it count. And, uh, and so that was my main focus. But, um, but now my band today, our touring band today is so tight and, you know, we don't talk to each other that much when we're home, but when we're on the road, we're a team and it, it shows on stage and, and it makes everything so much easier and, Everybody's so wonderful. Our crew that we have is just the greatest. And we look forward to seeing each other, you know, rather than hiding like, oh, no. <laughs> I mean, that's why teams win Super Bowls. I mean, <laughs> it's the it's the people get along. And it does, in, you're absolutely right, in, including the crew. Now, I I went out last year uh, with Joe Satriani, uh, 10 weeks in the U.S., 10 weeks in Europe, last year and this year. And I mean, everybody on that tour is upbeat, positive, and it just makes such a difference. Such a difference. It does. I mean, how you win a war if you're, you can't get your team together. Exactly. You know, you can't, really. Hey, when you were in the Runaways, I mean, being the, I'm the only band I can think that was female close to that time was the Go-Go's. And you guys are completely different, completely different. But I mean... <laughs> I mean, what was that like um, trying to make that mark? I mean, you must have felt like you had to fight twice as hard. We were before our time, for sure. You know, uh, like I said, it was, there were no women in the audience at all. There were most definitely no kids in the audience. And um, when we played the festivals, it was pretty much a big sea of denim and leather. And, you know, so... And we were young and, um, and, you know, people looked at us like, you know, tits and ass kind of thing. But then when they heard us play, it just did something to them. And, and they, they got, you know, they got excited. And so we were just before our time. Yep. But that's cool though. That's very cool. You guys were cutting edge. I mean, I mean, that's why, I mean, that's, that's incredible to be cutting edge. You know, in a business like that, that's incredible. What were you? So when you were, I mean, who were your inspirations? Like at that time when you were sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, trying to, who were you? Uh, like who were your mentors in guitar? Well, it's funny, you know, because you did those recordings with Glenn Hughes and Tony Iommi. I mean, Black Sabbath. The Black Sabbath riffs were my favorite riffs out there. You know, if you could sit at home and and play a black sabbath riff when you were 13 years old it, that was it that was that was the greatest for me and of course um richie blackmore you know deep purple that whole deep purple blackmore blackmore was my god yeah uh, you know I, I mean he still is as far as i'm concerned always was always will be the greatest and you know there's no um there's no shredding with either one of those guitar players. They make every note count and they play melodies and things that you, you can hum them after you hear them and walk away. Yeah. And I can hear it in your playing. I mean, it's no question. Now, were you guys, I mean, were you like when I graduated high school and I realized, Oh my God, this is my life. I'm going to be a musician. I started practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week. You know, in it, you know, wanted to be the best room I could be in to get into the best band that hopefully would get signed and then make records and go on tour. I mean, that was it. I mean, I remember my mom would say, "Hey, uh, Barbara wants to talk to you. Tell her I'm I, I'm busy." 
uh, or they want to, you know, everybody want to go out and celebrate because they graduated high school. I was like, no way. I've got to get, I got to be a badass so I can get a great gig. I mean, were you doing that too? Like, were you like music, 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 guitar, guitar? I did. It was my whole life. It's, it's, it isn't anymore because I have other things that I enjoy doing, but I mean, I still, music is my number one and it has kept me alive for all these years. And, and when the chips are down or you don't feel good or something's wrong or something somewhere, I always put on my favorite music, you know, depending on what's going on that day. But, uh, but at that time, that was it. That was all I wanted to do. I went around the neighborhood when I was a young girl living with my parents and I would ask the neighbors, you know, maybe they had a young son that could play a couple of things on guitar or, you know, so-and-so would come by in the minivan or something. And we would sit and I would pick their brain for anything and everything I could learn on guitar. And then when I joined the Runaways, I was 17 years old. Kim Fowley introduced me to Richie Blackmore. Oh, my God. I went to Richie's house and uh, and he showed me some things on guitar. Oh, my God. He played the cello for me. He taught me some things about minor scales and the snake charmer scales and things that I carry with me today. You know, that's the advantage of growing up in L.A. or the L.A. area. You're going to, you know, you got these people, at least in in your area. You know, as opposed to, I grew up in a small town of 3,000 people in Western Mass. They're, they're, you know, you weren't going to run into Richie Blackmore, that's for sure. No, but you still had a record player. Yeah. I mean, when when Are You Experienced came out, that was it. I shut my door on Christmas, one side, flip the record over the next side, flip it over the next side, flip it over. After 24 hours, my mom's like, can't you play another record? I mean, I'd never heard anything like that before. It was just, I was listening to the Beatles and the Stones or whatever was on the radio that was pop. And when, you know, Purple Haze came out and went, what? That was that. Oh, that was like, so cool. So cool. And still to this day, I, I, I carry Hendrix with me on stage to this day. You know, uh, just the last show we did, um, a couple of days ago, I was talking into my pickups, in, into my guitar. There's one part of the show that we do where um, the band comes down real quiet, and Bobby and Martin are doing this 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 groove, but it's real quiet, and I can actually pick up my guitar and sing into the pickups of the guitar. I mean, it's it's Hendrix. Yeah, it's Hendrix. Uh, did you ever get to see him live? No. I did once. As soon uh, as, as, soon as um, Axis Bold with Love, the second album, came out, and it was with Noel Redding and uh, Mitch Mitchell, and I I didn't want anybody to talk to me on the way up. I didn't want anybody to talk to me during the concert. It was like religion to me. And on the way back, I didn't want to talk to anybody. It was like my whole... My whole room in my house was all Hendrix, 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 except for that one Jane Fonda, sexy, hot poster <laughs> of her naked on the beach. That I had Ooh. in my room. <laughs> I mean, Love you know, it. Yeah. Um, you know, when I first joined uh, the Mellencamp band, um, you know, we rehearsed in a, in a little teeny room that was built into the earth with two little windows and it smelled like mold and we practiced we didn't know we didn't know how to make it so we practiced john said we practiced from 11 to 5 dinner break for 2 hours and then practice 7 to 11 5 days a week because i mean that's the only way you're going to get better and we would listen to all the records that were out the newest and the latest and listen and look at billboard and see what the top 100 singles were the top 200 albums and because we we were thinking we have to compete with Elk John, Billy Joel, Springsteen, the police, whoever was on the, I mean, whoever was relevant, that's what we had to do. I mean, did you guys do that too? You got like, oh my God, we got to, who's that? Wow, what are they doing? What are they doing? That kind of thing. I felt like I had to compete with every male musician in the music industry. Not just the ones that were on the top 10, you know, Billboard 100 or whatever. I I felt like 
I have to play as good as him or as good as my favorite record. And I never really knew where it all came from. I just wanted to, you know, and then as time went on, I started being um, on stage with these guys and uh, in studios with these guys and jamming backstage with these guys. And I'm thinking, I, I can't let them scare me, you know, just because they're a guy, they're just guitar players. And so, you know, I, I kind of put that whole thing out of my head. Uh, you're a girl, he's a guy. It's like, no, no, it doesn't apply anymore. Mm -mm. I'm not afraid of you. That's badass. That that was such a heavy re revelation at that age because uh, thinking the other way could have frozen you in a place for your entire life. And you broke that ice, that that mold right away. Man, bravo. Fantastic. That is so badass. That's like deep. And and you did, it sounds like you did it on your own. It wasn't like your dad said, hey, listen, they're just guy, you're a girl. You figured that out. That's, that, that is one of the biggest, uh, you know, obstacles to have gotten around because you were a girl in a male business. And, you know, that's phenomenal. Phenomenal. I, I just, you know, that's so good. So I got to bring up this guy because this guy was one of the greatest engineers. And I know we both recorded at Cherokee, George Tutko. Oh, my God. I love George. He was an unbelievable engineer. Just the greatest. He was the ultimate, you know. He would always get 100% out of every sound. Every sound. Every instrument, right? Yes. And you worked with him at Cherokee Studios, right, on Fairfax? I worked with him at multiple studios. The first time I met George was through Mike Chapman. Oh, yeah. When we did the, the Lita record. Yeah, and I just fell in love with him. I mean, he was a great guy. Yeah. Just the best engineer. And when he died, I was just so upset because there's no replacing people like that. Nope. He he's a Midwest boy. He was just a nice guy. I mean, I could that that was the I, I we did American Fool with him and I'd never heard drums sound like that. And John wanted all the drums way up loud in the mix, but everything he made was so powerful. It was incredible. Was that at Cherokee? Yeah, well, I did. We did half of it in the first half of the album. It was one of these things. We did nine weeks in Criteria in Miami. It came out with only four songs. And then we, two guys got quit the band. And so now it was just two guitars, John and me. And that's where John wrote Hurt So Good. And then we brought in some other songs. And then we went back to Cherokee. We went to Cherokee this time. Finished the album, and that album won two Grammys for John. Jack and Diane was a number one hit, and Hurt So Good was number two. Hurt So Good came out first, but we couldn't beat out Eye of the Tiger because Rocky was out, and that song is incredible. Uh, and you so, had a lot of competition. A lot of competition. Not to mention Sylvester Stallone in the movie. I know. It's a big competition. That's right there. It was self-marketing. Was it, it was huge. So anyway, though, but uh, George Shutko, I think he mixed it, but I remember the D brothers, Rob, wait, Rob Joe, it was Rob Joe and somebody, maybe D, yeah. Yeah, it was D. Yeah, and, they, they, and the dad worked upstairs. <laughs> Boy, there was a lot of partying going on in that studio, I'll tell you that. Ah, uh, I, I know it. I know. I know, it. just good times. Yeah. Now, did you guys- really great stuff. When you were with the Runaways, did you guys record with a click track? At all? Or was it just no? Okay, I I had a feeling, but man, you guys, there's one song I was listening to, you know, the the album Queens of Noise, and there's a very slow song called Born to Be Bad, and yeah, I I I had a feeling you didn't play with a click track, but I I want people to realize this is not easy. First of all, it's the first part; it's two sections in the song, and both sections are based on eighth notes, but the first section is groups of three. So it's very slow. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, one, two, three, two, and on and on. Second second is one, two, one, two, three, two, four, two, one, two, 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 three. So the eighth notes got, 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 got all the time. But the first section is in groups of three. Second section is groups of two. And I listened to it and I went, there's a swagger to it. The band's playing it. 
together, this is not an easy thing to do without a click. With a click, it's not easy, but without a click, you guys must have rehearsed your butts off to get that because that is that is badass what you did. Thank you, thank you. We had a great time. I love being in the studio. And I loved being in the studio with Sandy, Sandy West, our drummer who passed away. Oh, sorry to hear that. She died so young. She was 40, 41 when she died. But uh, cigarettes, you know, and just stuff. She did a great job on that song. She did a great job. But you know who her inspiration is, is Ian Pace. I mean, that was her main hero, you know, on yeah. drums was Ian Pace. And when I came in to audition for The Runaways, she's playing Highway Star. Woo! And so I was inspired by Richie Blackmore. So we hit it off right away. And I, she's playing that. I, I could play that. And so, you know, but that sets you off when you learn from from those kinds of uh, artists it sets you off to learn how to play with a feel and not so much to be spot on a click track and and bands like black sabbath played behind the beat and not necessarily on the beat and uh and that feel sometimes is taken away when you add the click track and i loved playing bass with sandy too so it worked for a while. I'd pick up the bass. And... When you wrote that song, did it come from the guitar part? Or who? How, what was the process of getting that song? Because it's a very interesting song, you know? I don't remember exactly where that came from. But uh, it's a big chorus, you know? And sometimes oh, you yeah. come up with the chorus first. Because I was born to be bad. Yeah. I'm not, I, I'm not, is it, I'm not glad or I'm not mad. I'm glad I did it. Yeah. And I'm born to be bad and I'm glad I did it. And so it's just one of those rebellious kind of lyrics. That's incredible. Uh okay, so <clears throat> <laughs> in my world in the guys band, we had groupies. You guys, what was that like? I mean, you must have had I mean, see I mean, I have no I have never asked a female artist this question before it's like oh my god you guys must have been hit on like a million times more than we did you know it's different completely different because uh i think a lot of the guys were afraid of me and it's kind of cool they wanted to talk to me and they wanted to put their hands on me but didn't and the, you know this is me and there, the other girls a lot of the other girls were um not into men. So they had women groupies and it was different. Oh yeah. It was different for them, but that left more guys for me. So what would happen is I would end up going, um, with one of the musicians, you know, like, you know, the sex pistols came around a few times and, and, uh, and, and just, you know, different musicians that would come around and, and the Ramones and stuff like that. So, you know, you would just end up having fun for the night yeah. and moving on. Oh, that's cool. You know, but they were the ones that could relate and the groupies were just scared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. When did you decide I'm going to have a solo career? I mean, you were in the Runaways and did it, was it after you left or while you were in the Runaways? You know what? I think I need to do my own thing. Well, you know, it, Kenny, the, the runaways were um, a learning process for me, a huge learning process, you know, touring with all the bands that we toured with and then coming away from the runaways after they broke up. I had to invent who is Lita. She's not in the runaways anymore. So now you're a solo artist. And who are you? What do you look like? What do you sound like? What are you going to wear? What are you going to play? And uh, I just kind of had to figure it out. You know, Nikki Six cut my hair. Yeah. And I I had a shag and and I went from the long, straight, you know, silky, silky hair to this like, you know, Motley Crue cut uh, shag hair. 
And, uh, and then uh, my bass player at the time was Neil Merriweather. And um, he was so talented. He made me some leather G strings. Whoa! And yeah, I know it, right? So I had a spider, almost like a crotch piece. Yeah, and uh, this leather bustier, and then he started making the leather gauntlets. So we had these leather gauntlets with eyes on them and spiders and all these like really gnarly shit. And um, and then I started playing BC Rich guitars. Because I wanted to be unique. I didn't want to be like anybody else. I didn't want to copy Jimmy Page or I didn't want to copy Hendrix with the, with the strats or anything like that. So I started playing BC Rich and I got involved with BC Rich and they made me the most best guitars ever on the planet. <laughs> and I still play them today. That's a good move, man. That, you were forward thinking. You were marketing, branding. You were figuring out how do I become leader? That's in every every aspect because you got to look. I you know, I have a rule of thumb, man. Even you you know you you have to always be as authentic as you can. And part of being authentic is you don't put your like when I go into my closet, I like to think go in blindfolded and whatever you put on looks cool and it looks like you. Everything else that doesn't <laughs> look like you throw it away. So that whatever you put on is you. And when you leave the house, look like you. And that's what I do. And it sounds like yeah. you, know, you figured that out very young. And it's not that easy to figure out what is you because it's got to be authentic. It's got to really be who you are. And that, that takes time. Yeah. It takes time. Well, there are leaders and there are followers. Yes, exactly. And I wanted to be a leader. That's for And sure. just wanted to be unique. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and that's what's made you leader forward i mean i love it and you, you, your career is like an example of somebody who found their purpose in life worked their butt off self-discipline perseverance fueled by your desire to be as great as you can be but you can't set it and forget it you just if you're that person you will do it until you're done you have to be that person that's it you only get one shot i have to say man that must have been incredible that you're co-writing a song with Ozzy Osbourne, <laughs> your hero, you know, you write, co-write, first of all, he's not, he's playing on your record, but then you co-write a song and co-sing it. That must have been one of your highlights, right? Yeah, it, it was cool. <laughs> and, you know, we were always in trouble, <laughs> me and Ozzy. Of course. And, uh, of course, you know. Of course. And, um, Sharon um, came to the studio one day. We were recording with George Tudko and Mike Chapman. Oh, man. And it was record one. Record one? No. Record one uh, was up on Lancashire, I think. Big yes, Street. in North Hollywood? Yeah. That was it. We were there when we wrote Close My Eyes Forever. And uh, Sharon came in and dropped off Ozzy. And we were in there recording. Ozzy comes in and I'm like, and she leaves. No, I don't leave him here. That's like like leaving meat for a lion. Don't eat it. <laughs> uh, but the thing that's cool is that people need to know that was the biggest song that Ozzy, as far as charting, that Ozzy ever had. Was that your biggest hit too? Yes, yes. It, it was because I followed Black Sabbath as a kid, you know, and they never had a top 10 hit single. It was just because of the darkness and the lyrical content and everything. And so Ozzy's first top 10 hit single was Close My Eyes Forever. That's incredible. And you guys barely wrote it. It wasn't like you set out to write it. You just kind of started writing shit. Yeah. That's incredible. That's the best yeah. way. Here's, I got a story for you. Like, in 1982, I was uh, on tour with Mel and Camp. We were promoting this album, American Fool, that eventually got two Grammys. And we uh, were opening up for Heart for nine months. and. John, for some reason, it was, it was more. I, anyway, we were flying in two two six seater planes, two six seater planes, and we had some wild times in them. Well, my plane, as we're going from Miami to Biloxi, Mississippi, all of a sudden stopped working in the middle of the sky. It just stopped, and of course, I heard if the plane stops, you can't start it again, which I thought was the truth. And we start going down, and I'm thinking, we're going to die. We're going to crash. This is, 
And, of course, it was kind of near where Leonard Skinner went down, of course. I'm freaking out. The guy obviously got it started. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. It got started somehow. I was crapping in my pants. When I got off the plane, I licked the pavement on the runway. Yeah. Did you guys, did you ever, in all your craziness, ever experience some crazy story like, you know, flying or driving or anything like like that? You know, I've been pretty lucky on planes. Pretty lucky. But I, the worst thing that happened to us was um, we were on tour with, with Bon Jovi over in Europe. And the tour was over and everyone was heading home. And we flew out of London Heathrow. And uh, I don't remember exactly what happened. We were supposed to be on Pan Am Flight 103. You remember that flight that went oh, down? Oh yeah! Over oh yeah! You were supposed to be on that. Well, yeah. And I, I got home. I mean, of course, it's a long flight. You know, by the time you get home, it's a whole day has gone by. And uh, I walked in the living room and put on the TV, and there was there it was on the news out of London Heathrow, Panam Flight One Hundred Three had gone down over uh, Lockerbie, Lockerbie, Scotland. That's scary enough. I fell to my knees. I was just devastated. Horrible stuff. Wow. I mean, that changed a lot of things when that happened. But uh, but no, I mean, so far, knock on wood, I've had really good luck on planes. Well, that was uh, that was as close as you want to get, you know. See, that's why I asked that because you know, it's so many flights, so many tour buses, so many. I mean, the odds get you know get more and more that something could go wrong yeah a lot of bad things on tour buses too but no i mean so far i've been okay and uh and i'm just one of those people where if i feel in my heart or in my gut that something's not right i won't get on oh, i won't good. go you know Wayne no. Wayne jennings was like that and he was the bass player in the crickets buddy holly in the crickets he lost the touring cost you probably know that he lost the toy cost to go on the plane, and Richie Valens won the toy cost. He went on the plane. So Waylon, from that day on, was so freaked out about flying, obviously. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. I mean, it's sort of all you have is your gut and your intuition. And if something tells you, no, don't go, it's just don't go. You know, figure out another way to get there. That's, that's good. You know, you know, take I, the next flight or something. You know, that's. You've said enough today that shows me that you really are in tune with yourself and you're true to yourself. And uh, that that's a really great quality. That's what's made you become successful and stay successful. Um, and I have to say that, that, you know, I read that, you know, you took a long time off, like from 1996 to 2007 to raise your boys. That is heavy because here you are. Music is everything, but something told you in your gut, no, I got to do this now. And that's that's heavy because you're not doing or you're not touring and doing what you've done your whole life. It's pretty, pretty, pretty admirable. And, and probably yeah, I mean, things change when you have a kid, you know, mm. and it's all of a sudden they become priority in your life. And and I just wanted to be a good mom to them. That's awesome. That's really good. So what haven't you done? Is there anything you haven't done in life that you, you know, that you want to do? I mean, what, there probably was never a plan B for you. It's always been leader forward music all the way and there's nothing else, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I love a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of things that I, I love. Um, I love clothes, fashion. You know, I, I, I design my own clothes. Everyone's like, oh, Lita, where did you get that? Well, I drew it on a little piece of paper, and then I had the professionals make it, and uh, it, and it's it's turned into a whole thing with me, you know, designing stuff, and and uh, a lot of people want to look like Lita, and so I think it might be something in the future, hopefully, that we could uh, we could do. That's very cool because I mean, you have the perfect venue to design something and then wear it on stage. You're the front person. I mean, you've got the can, you are the canvas. Yes. <laughs> you know what? I might, if I might, uh, 
I might have you design something for me. <laughs> now I'll I'll design it and I'll have you tell me where to get it fixed. You might design something. <laughs> I might regret. I might regret what you designed for me. <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, no, you won't be able to move. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, is there anything that you haven't done that you that you look forward to doing before it's all over? Or is it this is just the, you're right where you want to be until the sun sets? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, there's a lot of things that I love and a lot of things that I, I, I want to do. I did write a new record and uh, I want to I want to get it out for the fans. Um, I'm having a little bit of a, a an ordeal with record labels because here we are, 2023 going on 24 and it's not the same and they're not the same and everything else is just, you know, I, I don't want to hope and pray that it, it gets treated the way it should because it's not a cash grab this record is is a real record and i want the fans to have it hear it and see it because it's very visual as well as you know riffy and stuff it's just a killer record so i would like to get that record out and for the fans that's on my bucket list is that uh is this record is probably different from any other record you've done as it should be but is it like a concept record? Is what's different about this record? What's special about this? There was a lot of um, things that happened during the process of this record, and it, people. Uh, my manager died. My songwriting partner died. Wow. There was uh, drug rehab, drug withdrawals. Yeah. Uh, wow. Just all kinds of stuff that happened, and this record is real. And I, I, it's almost like I had to live it before I could write it. And it took a long time. It wasn't something that was written in a weekend. And so the songs are coming from a really hardcore place because they're just, they're just real. And I think a lot of people will be able to relate to them in their own way. Plus, it's rocking. It's a killer record. Sounds like my kind of record, Lita. It's real, it's authentic, it's rocking, and you know what? People can relate to stuff like that, you know, even if it's not the specific story. Everybody in life is going to go through some intense stuff at some point, or, and maybe many times. So Life is hard. Life is full of ups and downs, and, and uh, yeah, so thank you. I mean, but now we just got to get it out for everyone to hear. Well, Lita, man, I'm not going to keep you anymore, man. It's like, it's so cool to have connected with you and you're you're authentic uh you're unstoppable you're authentic and you're undeniably leader forward i love it and i really enjoyed going through listening to a lot of the music and you know kind of seeing you know doing research and seeing that you're the real deal and i'm uh, i'm really proud of you and just keep kicking ass thank you ken thank you i will got a lot of ass to kick <laughs> <laughs>